Just towards the end of the paper, you offer us the conceptualization of the Borromean brain. And, um, you know, obviously, the Kenyan ears light up and the Kenyans become curious. But it seems to me um, a very useful way of being able to bring into the conceptual mapping that you're doing um, real, imaginary, and symbolic in, in, in varying relationships. So could you tell us a little bit about that conceptualization, what you mean by it and what is useful, uh, what's instructive about it? Mm -hmm. So I think one very helpful um, sort of concept that comes from Lacan's theory of the Borromean knot um, is that it, you know, the, the knot, you know, the three rings, which are all holding each other together, um, that you, you need all three registers. And, you know, they're the somewhat simplified view of Lacan, you know, first the early Lacan imaginary, middle Lacan symbolic, late Lacan real, is I, I think it's useful to think of it in the sense of needing to sort of maintain all the registers, not to necessarily give priority to one, but also not to forget any of the others as well, that you really need all three to be critically thinking about, um, in this case, the brain. Um, so, and, and that's what I, I, I would like to emphasize, you know, in terms of just to give the example of what I was just speaking about. On the one hand, I'm speaking about, you know, the search for sort of satisfaction and the attempts and to a certain extent there is some success in it for, you know, us humans, we're not constantly in a state of total chaos, right, that there's some functioning of an imaginary in terms of these instincts, that there is some degree of connectivity and um, a, a union made. But at the same time, there is a particular motor function or act that is associated with it, the sort of method or the, the, the um, motor trace that is getting you there. And that trace can itself have a life of its own. Here I'm thinking about the signifier and the symbolic. And at the same time, there's the constant insistence and the pressure because of this lack of perfect harmony given by the real. Um, so sort of at, at a general sense, the needing to think of all three registers together um, uh, to have uh, a really a non-reductive conceptualization that isn't ignoring any key aspects of psychic life that, that Lacan and, and Freud um, uh, that, they that, that, that they emphasize. And I, I think in a way that section of the paper is an attempt to counter a potential um, simplistic reading, which you might charge the earlier parts of the paper saying like, oh, you know, I'm saying that real is in the lower, the brainstem, imaginary is in the right hemisphere and the symbolic is in the left hemisphere. And, you know, it's, <laughs> we're all good. Um, it's, 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 um, it's an attempt to, you know, I, I make the point there that, okay, yes, you know, I've, I've argued that because you very much do have language impairments when you lesion different parts of the left hemisphere. So in a certain sense, yeah, there's something about the symbolic and language that is indexed to the left hemisphere. But at the same time, there are many studies which find that, you know, the um, the more prosodic aspects of the signifier, sort of, you know, the musicality of the, the, the tone of voice that's getting used, um, uh, sort of extra linguistic, but nevertheless wedded to linguistic functions, that these are picked up and processed by the right hemisphere. And at the same time, it's not as if your sense of self um, as, you know, an ego in the world isn't impaired and ruptured when you have left hemisphere damage, in, in, although it's impaired in a very different way when you damage the right hemisphere. Um, you have much more types of delusional phenomena that occur in right hemisphere lesions. Um, but so that, that's all to say that um, even single concepts, you, they can't be thought of as localized or purely reduced to any one brain area that really, and again, you know, this is my more recent thinking regarding dynamic localization and dual aspect monism, that you need to think not only in terms of, you know, a positivistic association of, you know, this thing to this area, that thing to that area, and yeah, I might even say that they interact with each other, but really to say that, you know, they there's a certain discord or disjuncture between the interaction of these different areas, between sort of left and right hemisphere interaction, which is somehow undergirding not only the symbolic, but also the symbolic as it's a support for the imaginary um, uh, in, in, in Lacanian terms, but even the, the, the signifier itself in terms of the me speaking right now being processed by the left hemisphere, but the understanding and even the prosodic dimension of it, which is not necessarily semantic, but nevertheless, some type of intuitive being processed not only by the right hemisphere, 
structure, but also by upper brainstem structures and subcortical structures as well. For example, um, uh, Parkinson's patients who have um, uh, uh, degeneration of basal ganglia dopaminergic circuits. These are subcortical structures which are associated in that whole motor tagging um, a function that I spoke about earlier in terms of you know tagging the associated trace with um, excitation. Patients who have damage there, they also lose some capacity for prosodic understanding. So that even uh, it, you can take one type of uh, issue, but you you find it on the one hand being related to all uh, different aspects of the brain, and at the same time having some type of modulatory function with respect to all three registers. So that if you have one type of damage, it's not that you just damage the imaginary. Everything sort of gets reshaped and reworked in, in you know, an attempt to sort of restructure and to deal with you know, the situation post-trauma. But nevertheless, you, can't, you, you need to be thinking all three at the same time to, to not be missing anything that's quite important. You know, perhaps you've, already, you've uh, possibly already anticipated this or, or spoken to it a little bit, but um, I was also interested in how you refer to McGilchrist's work in thinking about the ambiguity of the signifier and um, it, it was just, it, it was interesting to me because, you know, there, there's multiple dimensions to the signifier, but, you know, you, you were interested and picked up on some of his distinctions to think about both the ambiguity um, and presumably the semantic ambiguity of the signifier, as well as the sonorous dimension, like the long um, of, of the signifier uh, and in terms of uh, hemispheres of the brain. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, and again, you know, maybe what you've gained from that, and if in any way you've departed from it, and and, and how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, Ian McGilchrist's work is it's it's a very useful reference, sort of because it does. You know, you can, there are many criticisms of it, but it does sort of the work of trying to think the brain as a the whole brain and it's a different parts in relation to each other, rather than focusing just on one particular area, which, as I've said, you know risks missing out on other important things that are going on. Um, and you know, his argument to give the, the short version of it is that the left hemisphere is associated with so-called mm, certainty or logical thinking. And that the right hemisphere is associated with uh, creativity, sort of you know, understanding the totality of it, um, the, even the ambiguity of um, certain processes, things that might be ambiguous for the left hemisphere, but the certain intuitive understanding of it via the right hemisphere. I, I think some of his arguments are a bit simplistic, but at, uh, but at the same time, you know, like I said, he's um, he he is giving the the due diligence to um, the years of hemispheric differences, which is uh, it, there there really are very few people who try to make that or the arguments for hemispheric differences um, uh, beyond very simplistic language and non-language um, uh, processes. Um, so I think that this is this is one useful. A framework for illustrating what I was trying to argue with, um, you know, maintaining these different dimensions, um, say, of the signifiers, the example I used here, you know, the, the signifier, um, you can think of it in different ways, you know, there is the signifier, and Ariane Bazan speaks of the signifier as a purely formal motoric structure in terms of the, the, the motor pattern, um, which is separate from the semantic understanding of that motor pattern. You know, I have certain motor patterns that I am down, down level executing through my mouth. It's, it's a motor function. It's a speech is an act. When you speak, you are acting. Um, really, so that's it, it's the motor dimension of it versus how I'm understanding what I'm saying. And you can, you can speak or you can hear something and not understand what it is, but nevertheless, it is you know, somehow hitting something. Um, and in that sense, you know, it might be resonating. And you know, this is the whole, in terms of the clinical Lacanian work, you know, the focus on the signifier, sort of picking up on ambiguous signifiers or how one signifier might be used in a certain meaning, but by, by repeating it, you know, there might be another meaning or another association given to it. Um, on the one hand, you know, it's linguistic, but on the other hand, there is this ambiguity to it. There is this potential for, you know, uh, conflictual meanings or um, a, a sort of extra linguistic sort of uh, uh, resonances with it. Um, and this is also hitting on that sonorous dimension as well, sort of the resonance of the signifier. And uh, in terms of um, there, there's, uh, if I believe the author was Esther Faye, or Fay, um, uh, sort of speaks of um, resonating signifiers as sort of the ones that get picked up on in an analysis, ones that sort of resonate that seem to be operating with something beyond just their purely simple linguistic 
semantic processing. Again, I think about this not only in terms of left and right hemisphere, but also in terms of subcortical processes and that motor tagging process as well. Um, I think it's a really important um, uh, function where the, the trace, the motor trace itself is tagged with a certain type of excitation, which is different from homeostasis. It's different from even sort of the, it's different from the processing of that ambiguity, the processing of that excitation being different from the, that excitation itself, in addition to, be different, to being different from that motor trace being taken up into a linguistic network in terms of language as we typically understand it. So then you get this lovely bifurcation of the signifier in terms of the symbolic aspect of the signifier, the quote unquote imaginary aspect of the signifier as you know, semantic understood, and the real aspect of the signifier as the letter, as the purely um, sort of trace that is empty of meaning, but nevertheless tied with some type of jubisance or some type of um, uh, excitation that has, has resonance for the subject. Um, uh, so uh, again, you know, it's, it's this um, emphasis on thinking of the dynamically distributed um, processes, processes of the brain to show how you can think the brain without being victim to a sort of accrued reductionism.